Um, in, in terms of an agenda today, um, I'll give a, a brief overview of who Olympic are and how we, how we help brands from a, from a visual perspective. Uh, then I will hand over to Jason and he will um, take a little bit of time to, to talk through the last couple of years in terms of how things have worked for IKEA from a, from a visual perspective and what things mean to them now. Um, before I sort of go directly into Olympic, I think it's, it's worthwhile uh, explaining the idea behind way, why we came to exist in 2010. Um, I th it's a pretty simple concept. Uh, the way that consumers and brands engage with each other, with each other has changed pretty drastically. Uh, the, the rise in, in smartphone use uh, and, and, and the rise of, of, of social media uh, has meant that that traditional consumer journey has changed, changed pretty significantly. Uh, what we have on the left-hand side, and there's a big old hole on the right-hand side, but that's okay, I'll describe it in a second. Uh, what we have on the left-hand side is the um, traditional consumer journey. It runs you through sort of a, a pretty linear process from, from awareness down through to purchase. I think it's not the most accurate representation now, and I think with the rise of smartphones in particular, what's happened is that those lines have blurred. So to maybe give an example to make this a little bit easier to explain. If you look at a, a modern consumer, what they might be doing is, is scrolling through something like Pinterest. They see a particular image which they like the look of. Maybe there's a particular look or a particular style which they like. They see an individual product. They look at that product. Maybe then they go onto Google, do a little bit of research, read a couple of reviews. Then they'll jump on, maybe watch a YouTube video of someone doing a little bit more in-depth look at that product itself. But then life happens. They need to go to work, they need to go and pick up kids from school, they need to come and attend a, a brand conference. And they step out of that consumer journey, and then maybe an hour, a week, whatever, later, they think, actually, you know what, I want to jump back in and I want to start to, to consider and look at that process again. So maybe they'll jump on Instagram and then start looking at actual products and images themselves again and, and be re-entered into that process. And it's kind of sort of a, a rinse and repeat with the limited time span that people have and attention span that people have. They're dropping in and out of that process. I think the point that I'm trying to make is that it's no longer simply enough for a brand to be at that buy now position. Uh, you need to be engaging, interacting, influencing individuals throughout and consumers throughout that entire buying process. I think that poses a, a pretty significant challenge for, for every single brand. With the, the hundreds of different touch points and the, the hundreds of different ways in which a user is driving their own journey now, a brand needs to be able to surface and source content that is relevant, that's engaging, that's authentic that's gonna keep that consumer in that process and then eventually drive them to that purchasing moment. Couple that with the fact that the modern consumer is, um, is pretty, pretty high maintenance, they're pretty demanding in terms of what they want. Uh, uh, of a recent survey with around 6,000 consumers which were included in it, what we found is that most users or consumers don't want to see the same brand product image or the same brand image itself being serviced to them across all these of hundreds of different touch points. They want variety, they want something that's engaging, they want something that's authentic. And what they actually stated was that something like user-generated content is actually more preferable to them than a branded image, simply because it's more authentic, it's more tangible. If you see an individual like yourself using a specific product or, 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 or buying a product and using a product in a specific way, it's easier to relate to and it helps to keep them included in that process. Additionally, with the, the increase in the availability of video, users are engaging with video in a much stronger way when it comes to the actual purchasing process. Um, and again, so this is you know, compounding the issue in terms of the multiple touch points. They want multiple formats and multiple styles. And then finally, and, and sort of the most needy piece of this is obviously that the users want to be able to feel a part of that brand now. So it's not simply a, a faceless brand. I think that was highlighted quite nicely in the Monzo talk earlier. Uh, it's not simply just a faceless brand saying you should buy this or you should do this. It's a brand that's going to directly engage, bring their consumers in, uh, and actually speak to them on a level, but then actually have the users be a part of it and be represented as a brand itself. So this posed our, our co-founders back in 2010 with the question of how can we 
fill that content gap, which most, of, most, most brands are, are, are coming across, and, and how are they going to be able to fill those holes? And what, what they did over time was to develop sort of a three-product suite which filled part of these holes, and Jason's going to talk in a second about one of those particular products and how it's relevant. But from a, so from a user-generated content perspective, what we have is a platform that enables brands to, to identify and collect content. But then secondly, and probably most importantly, with something like GDPR coming into place now, is obtain the rights from those users directly and then activate into additional channels. On the video piece, we all know it, you know, it can take time, it can be expensive to create video. Through the use of branded specific templates, what the Olympic Content Emotion platform enables brands to do is to quickly and at scale and at relatively low cost, produce video and roll that out. And then finally, from the, from the engagement and the, the ownership piece, the, the influencer management platform allows brands to, to identify individuals. We're not talking celebrities here, we're talking micro-influencers, we're talking advocates. But what it does, it, it enables brands to identify individuals who engage with relevant markets, form relationships with them, whether that's from a monetary perspective or, or, or simply from, a, from an incentivization perspective, and then to, to build and, 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 and develop those relationships over time. Um, don't spend too much time on that aspect. What I'll, what I'll do is I'll hand over to Jason, and he can talk in a little bit more detail in terms of what IKEA have been doing from a visual perspective over the last couple of years. Hi, everyone. Uh, so, yeah, as I've been introduced, my name is uh, Jason, so I'm the Web Communications Manager for the UK and Ireland at IKEA. Um, I just realized I almost wore the same T-shirt today that I was in my profile picture, so that was very awkward. But uh, I went for the Steve Jobs looks instead, so that, that will have to do. So just uh, before we talk about UGC and how we work with Olympic to, to kind of build UGC into our content strategy, I just want to give you a bit of a, a picture of who we are at IKEA. I'm sure many of you know who we are. Uh, but there's some really interesting uh, facts here in terms of uh, how, how we are as a brand. So we were founded in 1943, so actually we're quite, a, quite an old company. And we were founded by uh, Ingvar Kamprad, and that is where the I and the K uh, comes from in the logo, in case you, you didn't know that. Um, and actually, this uh, little green box here is our first store. Uh, so Ingvar Kamper had really just started in IKEA selling pens and uh, stamps and things like that. Uh, obviously, this store is a lot uh, more difficult to get lost in than our current stores today, so uh, they've, they've definitely grown. Um, we have 367 stores in 30 markets, and we're constantly uh, expanding. So you may know we've also just uh, opened uh, some stores in India as well, which is very exciting. Uh, we've had uh, 838 million visits uh, across all our markets in financial year 18 and 2.35 billion web visits. Uh, so that's quite a lot of people. Um, we've been in the UK for over 30 years, so we did uh, uh, celebrate uh, our 30 year birthday last year. Uh, our first store was actually in Warrington, and uh, a very interesting choice of location for a first store, but it's still there and it's still doing very well, so uh, it must be, must be a good thing. Um, but lastly, I think more importantly, our vision, uh, and this is to create a better everyday life for the many people. So there's, there's two really important things here. Uh, the first being a better everyday life. So we like to not just cater for the special occasions. We want to really improve everyone's life at home on an everyday basis. Uh, but also about catering for the many people. We don't really want to just target one specific demographic or audience. Uh, our product range is designed to be as affordable as possible uh, so that many people can, can purchase from us. This is uh, actually a picture of Almholt in Sweden, and I'm sorry if I've pronounced that incorrectly. I know there's one Swedish person here, <laughs> so uh, I apologize. Um, but this is basically what I call IKEA town, so 90% of the people from here uh, work in IKEA. Um, we have a lot of uh, different buildings here. We have our design labs, we have our testing labs, we, have our, uh, we even have an IKEA hotel. Um, but more importantly, we have our um, IKEA Communications, which is our in-house production agency, where we produce most of our content. So the, the interesting thing is we, we have a lot of global content. Uh, it's very much produced globally for the, the purpose of being distributed across markets. Uh, actually, I checked last week, and we have about 200,000 assets currently available in our dam today. So it's not that we're using UGC because we're short of content. Uh, the challenge we have, though, is that obviously when you create content on a global level, 
you try to really make it based on a, a, a kind of global insight that is relevant to as many markets as possible. But as it reaches the markets, it does start to become diluted. Um, so in terms of the authenticity of our content, we really looked for something to, to kind of add to the mix that would be more market relevant for us. So the global content uh, adds value by being very aspirational and inspirational, but in terms of the authenticity and market relevance, this is where we really find UGC could really play a role in. So this here is our uh, customer experience journey. So you might recognize this little guy from our assembly instructions. He's very famous. He's always building. Um, but um, what I just wanted to say is that when we've really looked at how we can use user-generated content um, in different ways, uh, we really started to map out different uses for it. Uh, and what we've found is that there are uh, the three stages of exploring, getting your inspiration, filtering to kind of decide what you might want, and then actually purchasing. UGC actually works in all of those uh, stages. It's more about how you present that content and how you tailor it and where you place that on your social channels and website uh, that actually makes sure that you're fulfilling the objectives and needs of the customer at different stages. Uh, and as Ali said, the, the journey is not fluid. Uh, it's more fluid uh, now than it used to be. It's not a funnel anymore. People are interacting and have different needs at different stages. So the more visible we can be with the right content, then the, the, the more chance there is of uh, a customer purchasing with us and purchasing more often as well. Uh, super important, um, we really wanted to adopt a bit of a test and learn approach with user-generated content. Um, when we approached the global organization, when we started working with Olapic uh, and made the suggestion that we would like to place content that wasn't created by us on our own channels, uh, everyone freaked out and thought, that's insane, what are you doing? This is, uh, we, we need control. Um, so so what, what we did was that we thought, well, let's, let's really try and understand UGC um, in, in a kind of test, testing approach and, and, and really kind of see where the value is added for the customer. And then we can then decide where we can roll it out and where it makes sense. So we took a, a more careful, gradual approach. Um, and now we have a very strong execution across many channels, which I'll, I'll show you now. So in terms of uh, co-creating with our customers, this is uh, super important. And I just wanted to show you some examples of how we uh, build communities on our social channels using UGC. Um, so here on the right-hand side, we have uh, a kind of call to action that we go out with if we are looking for specific content from our customers. Um, and then the, the, the one on the left there is actually part of a, a post that we, we have done and do regularly, organically, featuring UGC that people have shared. Um, what we find here is that we don't actually offer an incentive uh, encouraging people to, to share, other than the fact that we will be able to use that content on our website, so the, the chance of, of obviously getting that exposure. And that's actually enough for our customers. We actually get so much uh, response to this uh, just through organic call to actions. And what we find is, is uh, we find that eight out of our 10 top organic posts that we have done via social have featured UGC, which is fantastic. And we also see that the, the reach of our UGC posts is 20, 27% higher than any reach that we get from our organic owned content posts. So for whatever reason, uh, the algorithm which Instagram uses to really expose the content uh, really favors UGC, most likely because people are highly engaged with it. So this is our lovely website and our uh, homepage um, from a few months ago, right enough. But uh, I just wanted to kind of show you different executions that we've done here. Um, so we actually introduced UGC to our homepage. Uh, previously, our homepage was this long because everyone wanted to say everything, and we thought that was relevant for customers. Uh, but when we looked at the data, of course, that's not really the reality of how people are, are kind of uh, engaging with this type of page. Um, so we really kept it simple with one main commercial message and then a UGC widget. Um, the benefit of this being that this is constantly refreshing itself um, based on the level of engagement that customers have with the different content, which means every time someone comes to our website, they'll get a different experience. Uh, and the benefit is that because it's the most engaging content, it will always be seasonally relevant and, and very uh, show a lot of vitality as well, which is great. And it doesn't require any work from us in the background to, to maintain that. 
Uh, what we've actually found, interestingly enough, that even though the UGC module is below our main message, the engagement rate that the, what the module gets is 2.7 times uh, more than the engagement we get with our own messages. So I think that kind of uh, answers its, itself, really. We also have a UGC hub uh, on the website. So this is where all of our approved uh, user-generated content uh, can be viewed, almost like an internal Pinterest uh, board. Um, so this is for inspiration, but also it allows people to filter because we've added filters on the top so that people can choose the category that they would like to explore more of. So it allows them to kind of narrow down their search if they are in the market for a sofa or a bed or whatever. Um, what we find is so, some really great uh, engagement with that. So we have 100,000 views to that hub per month. And also the click-through rate is 27% uh, from anyone who lands on the page, which is much higher than our kind of average click-through rate. So clearly it's a, it's a very, uh, a page full of engaging content. And then now we're moving into the kind of conversion side, so the e-commerce side. So how can we use UGC to convert customers? Um, so what we have is two versions here, which we have rolled out. Um, so if we have been able to collect three or more images of the same product with UGC, we will show those, uh, those products first. Um, however, we were only able to really reach about 1% of our product pages by following this approach. Um, so what we decided to do was, was to really expand that out a little bit, and rather than just showing UGC featuring that product, we would also show other UGC images of products in the same category, so it almost works also as, a, as an alternative recommendation engine as well. Uh, and by running that process and that change, we were able to increase the coverage of uh, PDPs from 1% to 30%, and we're continuing to, to expand upon that until we get to hopefully 100% one day. Um, so when you then click on a, a customer clicks on a piece of content that they like, uh, this is the interesting part as well. So we also are able to connect our product feed to the post. Um, so we also have a, a moderation team as part of the Alapic, um, Alapic process who will actually connect uh, all the products to the images so that it makes it very easy for customers to buy what they see. Um, and the, the, the interesting thing we've done recently as well is that um, it's not just IKEA products that we will show in the product feed se uh, segment. Uh, if we see something in the image that we sell something similar to, we will also show that product as a way of getting the look so it's a bit more of a home furnishing expertise uh, rather than just uh, sticking to the, the products uh, that we own in our image. So I think this is a much better experience for the customer because they, they don't really care where something's from, they just want, they kind of like the style, so therefore we try and help them uh, achieve that. Um, what we find is, is the conversion rate uh, for anyone who interacts with UGC uh, on any of the pages is 3.54 times more than our normal site conversion rate. So it just shows you that the more uh, exposure we get to it, then it will obviously help, uh, help our bottom line as well, which is, which is great. Uh, the last thing I just wanted to talk about was just the future potential of UGC as well. Um, so IKEA is really interested in understanding people's lives at home. So we go out in every market and we visit people's homes, we interview people, we spend time with them in order to really understand what their everyday needs are in order to kind of uh, provide relevant uh, expertise but also develop a, a relevant product range. Um, that can be quite costly and time consuming and resource heavy. Um, so what we've realized is that we actually have access to all of this uh, content, which is already being shared organically, which allows us to peek into people's homes in a less intrusive way, but actually really understand if what we believe people to be living like is actually the reality. Uh, and if not, how can we then tailor uh, what we do in the future to accommodate that? So we've really started talking to the global organization to find out how we can kind of harness this power uh, to, to actually turn it into insight, which will actually help other parts of our business uh, as well. And of course, all this is connected uh, to our um, brand positioning uh, in the UK, which is about giving everyone, uh, creating a wonderful everyday for the many people. And uh, I think UGC really helps uh, aid that process. Thank you. <laughs>